Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel, Geopolitics of the COVID-19 Infodemic. I am Luisa Bandeira, Associate Editor with the DFR Lab. For those just joining us in the previous lightning talk, my colleague Tessa Knight and I spoke about how states used the idea that COVID had been engineered by humans to pursue their own geopolitical goals. But that was not the only instance in which state actors twisted uh, what the WHO calls the infodemic to their own ends. Today, we will discuss the information conflict within the COVID-19 pandemic. We will start with a Q&A, and then we have time to answer questions from the audience. So if you're watching us, please send your questions. For today's discussion, I'm joined by four distinguished experts that have been working on this topic since the beginning of the pandemic, and they have different regional perspectives. Uh, Nika Alexejeva is a digital forensic researcher with the Digital Forensic Research Lab, the DFR Lab, uh, seconded by NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence. Her specific research interest is tracking and preventing the spread of disinformation on digital engagement space being it social media, online news, blogs, or forums in the Baltic states and beyond. Inan Chen is a journalist working with First Draft. He reports on disinformation activities both inside and outside of the United States. Previously, he has worked uh, as an investigative fellow at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalists cross-border data project and researched on transnational money laundering activities and the real estate industry in New York City. Joey She is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute's cyber program focusing on digital information, controls and operations, security, political violence, and the impact of technology across the Middle East and North Africa. She also consults for the World Bank. And finally, we have Elise Thomas, an OSINT analyst with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. She has also written as a freelance journalist for a range of publications, including Bellingcat, Foreign Policy, The Daily Beast, Wired, and others. She works across a range of topics, including foreign influence operations, conspiracy theories, and online extremism. So I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. And I know that it's very late for some of you, especially Elise. Uh, I would like, so I'm going to start with you, Elise, since you are joining us and I know it's uh, 4 a.m. there. <laughs> I would, wanted to ask you, um, how do you see this question? Uh, how have states sought to use COVID-19 mis- and disinformation to their own advantage? And do you think some states have been more successful than others? Um, I mean, look, I, I was thinking over this and I I think the difficult thing is there isn't actually like a tidy bottle answer. Like I'd like to be able to give you uh, like a neat, succinct answer that would sum up everything. But the reality is, I think what we've seen since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic is a lot of contradictory trends, um, a lot of very regionally specific trends. So we've seen the information cycle in some ways speed up to the point of like incredible hyperactivity where like almost nothing sticks for longer than five minutes like if you said to someone in September of, of 2020 if you reminded them at the time that Iran shut down like an, an airline uh, like a plane full of its own passengers the reaction generally was like oh yeah that happened you know like like everything just moved so fast in parts of the news cycle in 2020 but in other parts it actually the news cycle slowed down or it was completely drowned out altogether um and I guess the so, so I guess when we think about sort of how states have used the COVID-19 pandemic, it really depends on um, which states, it depends on which regions, it depends on which issues. Um, mm. So we saw like uh, a significant, we, we saw essentially the, the, the creation of a little sort of disinformation cluster around the issue of COVID-19 itself. Um, but we also saw sort of existing disinformation operations around, for example, geopolitical issues in a bunch of regions, for example, in Africa, in, in Europe, in Asia. Um, which sort of very much flew under the radar, um, under the cover of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I think overall the, 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 the broad picture is actually one of sort of fragmentation and disintegration rather than sort of a, any sort of cohesive overall effect. Thank you, that's extremely interesting. And I think that fragmentation is something that we really want to uh, talk about in this panel. So I'm gonna pass this to Keenan to get your thoughts on the, the same question. Do you think there's, 
uh, how did states use uh, this information and do you think any of them was like more successful than others? Well, it's hard to compare one to the other, right? I mean, um, during our monitoring, you know, I pick up, you know, like disinformation campaign, you know, in the US and, and also in China. And um, one thing I noticed is like, um, during very on, you know, in the pandemic, China actually denied that, uh, that um, the virus originated in the US. You know, he actually published a fact check. One of the earliest uh, rumor was that um, there was this like military convention. Uh, I mean, this like sports game in Wuhan in 2019 and one of the athletes, you know, from the US brought the virus to China and several publications that are owned by, you know, the Chinese government, they actually published the bomb, you know, on, on the narrative. But very uh, quickly, you know, um, the diplomats and, um, you know, uh, the propaganda department saw the opportunity. So they, so they switched it and then they started to amplify, you know, the narrative that um, the pandemic was like, it was started in the US in a Fort Deer trip in Maryland. And that narrative has lived on and, you know, there's also like, um, they also amplify, you know, like just the system is different. In the US, you know, we have like freedom of speech and, you know, there's like, uh, you know, and they amplify this information after in the US. So, yeah, so I would say it's very hard to <laughs> compare, uh, but I don't think they're doing bad at all, you know. Yeah. Got it. Um, Nika, do you want to talk about that? Sure. In my view, countries acted more opportunistically because countries are led by people. And as uh, to our most recent knowledge, the virus is still of um, like natural or origin. Uh, policy makers, uh, state prop propagandists were also um, like in information vacuum for some time and they had to act with what is already out there in the information space and probably steer the conversation to which direction they want. This is exactly the behavior I observed with, with Russia's um, information activities. For instance, first, uh, the narrative was that while the whole Europe and the Western world is struggling and closing down because of this virus, Russia is still happily living their life as, as, as it is. And um, of course, um, Probably there, there was some um, period while politicians like learned that, well, this virus is there to stay, so they need to adjust their narrative. And so it changed towards, uh, well, we see that this is global pandemic. We are here to help. And maybe you remember the mask diplomacy where, um, and like other medical aid diplomacy that Russia did by sending masks and other equipment to Italy, to other countries that were like under like very, very severe um, epidemical situation. So uh, this information adapted as situation evolved. And I don't see any clear strategy except uh, basically what uh, propaganda uh, creative minds could create at certain points of time. Okay, so I think we are, there's a consensus for me here that uh, you can't really compare how one state acted to the other. And then Joey, I uh, want to pick your brain on that and see if you agree with everyone else and what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think um, in the case of Egypt, which is the country that I focused most on throughout the course of the pandemic, um, I think we really saw from the beginning that the state used um, the infodemic in particular to legitimize and justify its oppressive strategies. Um, and I think early on, um, at the beginning of March even, the state decided in Egypt that the uh, pandemic was not necessarily a health crisis, but presented first and foremost a crisis of legitimacy um, for the regime and was a security risk. Um, and so I think we saw this in the way that they um, dealt with uh, various criticisms of their response. Um, in the summer, many doctors were complaining about a lack of PPE. Um, there was lots of commentary on social media saying that the official numbers were much lower in comparison to the numbers that people were observing in the hospitals. 
Um, and in response, the state um, arrested doctors, arrested citizens, um, fined people. Um, and so I think we really saw, and you know, this isn't, um, these strategies and techniques and tactics of oppression were not unique to COVID. Um, the Egyptian state is an authoritarian state, um, particularly since 2013 um, with President Sisi, um, but we really saw these um, in full force. Um, and I think particularly as um, the vaccine is beginning to be rolled out, it's been really slow um, in Egypt, but it's starting to tick up a bit more. Um, they're saying rhetorical strategies to dismiss legitimate criticism of their policies uh, are being used to bring attention to actual conspiracy theories and actual disinformation about the vaccine. And I think that the consequences of that um, are going to be all the more insidious in the weeks and months to come when you have high rates of hesitancy and real conspiracy theories that are preventing people from getting the vaccine. And the state's only response is to say that these are just rumors from mal uh, malicious actors outside the country trying to destroy unity uh, inside of the state. And people just don't really listen to that narrative at this point. It's so overwrought. Um, it's so much relied on. Um, and so I think that they're really going to run into a problem in creating effective public health messaging um, when it comes to the vaccine rollout because of the way that they have dealt with the infodemic up until now. And actually, if I, uh, like I, I think that's a really good point that Joey raises. And if there is one thing that maybe is consistent across all of the different countries, um, it's this like really interesting interplay that we've seen between um, legitimate political actors, <clears throat> legitimate political actors and the, the discourse around disinformation um, and the willingness to either use that to crack down on free speech um, or on the flip side, the willingness of legitimate political actors to flirt with conspiracy theories or to flirt with disinformation where it's politically advantageous to them. Um, and I think that is definitely something that we've seen across a lot of areas. Yes, and um, very interesting to hear from Joey because as I was saying in the lightning talk before, we were talking about how we looked at the bioweapon bioweapon narrative or the narrative that the, the virus had been created by humans and that the situation that you that you just told us about Egypt was very similar to what we saw in Iran for instance so I think it's it, there's a trend there with authoritarian states and how we understand that um, Elise I want to go back to you and ask you more specifically about uh, China US information uh, conflict Right, uh, I know that you worked, uh, you published work about this automated um, campaign uh, in China and how they were targeting uh, the US and US actors. Can you tell us a little bit more about this conflict, how, how it played out and what are the, what are the consequences that you're seeing? Um, sure, I mean, so as part of my previous work at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, we worked on a number of reports on um, uh, what is an ongoing campaign um, involving the actor behind um, also some of the reports done by DFR Lab and some of the other like other investigative bodies in this space, um, sometimes referred to as Spamiflage Dragon, which is sort of this like kind of like sprawling campaign across uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, which often involves like what appear to be commercially purchased accounts, um, sort of just pushing out bulk content, um, which uh, follows a a variety of different narratives that sort of um, adhere to whatever's happening at the time. So we've seen them pick up on the Black Lives Matter protest. Obviously COVID has been a really big focus. Um, and this content tends to be pushed out in uh, multiple languages. Um, so it's often uh, like auto translated English and then uh, Mandarin text. Um, they've got videos with sort of these terrible like robotic voiceovers. Um, and actually I think the really striking thing about that campaign is that it has not evolved. Um, it, over the sort of the course of the past two years, like I said, it's been very consistent. Like there's been a, a multitude of reports on this activity, and it just it just keeps going. Like it, it like it's it's not they they've had all their accounts taken down. They just buy new ones. It's fine. Um, and it it it's interesting that they haven't. Um, but, but at the same time, even as they just keep going, they don't seem to be getting uh, any meaningful organic traction whatsoever. Like as far as we can tell nobody is engaging with this and I think it's partly because the content is so bad like it's it's very poorly targeted content no one is going to sit down and genuinely watch these videos 
Um, and yeah, I, like I said, I think the striking thing is actually that it has not evolved, even as so much else about the information space has changed and so much about the, um, the information space, particularly involving the US and China. Like we have seen, like Kin had said, some like interesting um, developments in terms of the willingness of like certain Chinese political figures to uh, flirt with conspiracy theories in the same way that, um, and Chinese state media to flirt with conspiracy theories in a similar way to what we've seen with, for example, Russian state media in the past, that sort of nexus between Russian state media and US conspiracy actors. Um, we have seen that developing and been relatively effective in China, but this particular campaign um, has, has just kept trucking, even, even though like it, it's not getting any traction, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And I think it's actually quite an interesting example of the disconnect between uh, whoever is likely to be commissioning this campaign, because I suspect this is a campaign that has been outsourced to a commercial provider um, for, for a number of reasons that are sort of laid out in the various reports. Um, whoever is commissioning the campaign versus whoever is implementing the campaign. I'd imagine the people who are um, you know, actually sitting there at their keyboards typing this stuff out are probably aware that nobody is seeing, nobody is seeing their activity, but it doesn't matter because they're continuing to get paid. Um, and, you know, whoever is paying them probably like, I don't know if they think it's effective, um, but it, yeah, it, it just keeps rolling. And that point is extremely interesting. And we've seen other uh, state-backed operations that actually do not get a lot of tractions, but we see that states everywhere they, they keep investing in these campaigns it's it's quite interesting to me and, and would be great to try to understand what's happening there uh keeping on the the topic of uh china and the us i'd like to turn to you kina uh for you to talk a little bit more in depth about um your work with china and one thing that really interests me is how in your work you're not only looking at uh what is coming from China targeting the US, but you also published an article uh, recently talking about, uh, it was a very thought provoking story about some misleading narratives uh, related to Chinese vaccines that appeared on the Mandarin and Cantonese language websites of Radio Free Asia, a news outlet that is funded by the US government. So I would love to hear uh, from you about that. Sure, yeah, so over the past half a year, we've been looking at um, this video operation called Radio Free Asia. It's uh, funded by US government. And it has, um, you know, similar to Voice of America or like Radio Free Europe, um, it has 10 different languages and two of the, and two of its operations is in Cantonese and Mandarin. And um, presumably most of their readers are, you know, are from mainland China, if they can get around, the, um, the firewall, and from Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, and maybe some Southeast Asian countries where there were like, uh, you know, a lot of like Chinese uh, speakers. And one interesting thing we realized is that, uh, so we conducted a sentimental analysis of all the contents that we published uh, since uh, late last year and up until May. And we found out that the, a majority of those contents, you know, over 70%, uh, close to 80% are negative about the two Chinese made vaccines, which has now been, you know, approved and included uh, in the WHO's uh, COVAX uh, program. And, you know, a lot of, like, uh, a lot of these um, articles and narratives are very similar to the right-wing or like conservative uh, media outlets in the U U.S. how they portray uh, the mRNA vaccines or how you know it's unsafe, it's unproven, and you know they amplify um, the potential side effects. And it's also interesting that um, the two Chinese websites run by uh, Radio Free Asia, they never mention uh, the suspension of the Johnson and Johnson vaccines at all. Uh, they only mention in one instance about um, the problem of the AstraZeneca vaccine, you know, which is now being used in Taiwan. And yeah, I, I mean, the purpose of uh, this exercise is, um, you know, is to, well, is to, sh is to share light on, you know, there is also, um, um, I would say like, uh, like state-led uh, misinformation or this information campaign, you know, coming out from um, the US or some other countries that we, you know, that we haven't like focused on. Thank you. Yeah, I find that extremely interesting because usually when we're talking about vaccine nationalism, etc., we are looking at countries or 
narratives are coming that are coming from countries such as China and Russia, but the, the look, your look on what is coming from the US is extremely relevant for this discussion, I think. Yes, since we talk, keep going. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I just want to add to that, uh, you know, uh, we probably haven't heard about like real Asia in the US, but uh, you actually have, you know, like me, he has like, like millions of followers on social media, on Facebook and, uh, and YouTube. And some of his articles, uh, which like clearly misleading, were reprinted, you know, in the local, uh, by, the, by the local media, you know, in Hong Kong and Taiwan. So, uh, so there's like actually harm to that. Yeah, there's, there's a domestic effect as well, right? Uh, as a Latin America, I can say that this uh, resonates a lot with me because in Latin America, we are getting many vaccines, uh, Chinese vaccines, and then all this comes and it's kind of like, there's a huge confusion and people don't really know what's happening because I think we are getting both sides of the information. So we get many people saying horrible things about the side effects or the lack of efficacy of uh, Chinese and Russian vaccines. And on the other side, we also hear about the problems with AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, etc. So I think that this um, affects us a lot. Since we're talking about vaccines um, and I just mentioned Russia, I would like to turn to Nika and ask you about, um, so when we were working on uh, the bioweapons or the weaponized report, I kept asking you a question all the time, which was, what is Russia doing? What is the strategy there? And I think to me, it was really hard to understand that maybe there wasn't this huge strategy behind, you know, everything that we saw, Russia was the first um, state to actually say, well, it's the US's fault and this was published on state media. So I was hoping uh, that Russia would go, go full on to that narrative and it did not happen. So, um, and then with vaccines, I thought it was going to be the same, but last month we saw all these reports about this Russian uh, linked PR company that was asking influencers to say bad things about the Pfizer vaccine. And then I thought, well, is it more organized now, uh, right? Are we seeing now this kind of like big Russian effort, uh, this information effort that we saw with MH17 or with this cripple case? And then apparently not because nobody really knows if that PR firm was actually uh, connected to like, it was, if it was this high uh, coming from the high instances of Russia or whether it was just a PR company that was acting by itself. So I'm going to ask you the same question again. Uh, does Russia have an agenda? Uh, is it coordinated? What do you think is happening now with the vaccines topic? I think it's definitely a state-backed marketing campaign uh, to promote Russia as successful uh, nation that can um, be independent on its own, uh, regardless of any sanctions. And vaccines are demonstrating its um, alleged success in, uh, in, in scientific and medical, like pharmaceutical field. Because Sputnik was announced to be the number one, uh, the first vaccine uh, ever approved. And though it, was, it didn't uh, finalize its third stage research, it was already uh, approved for uh, like use on, on people just to have the slogan that Sputnik V was the first. And uh, then, uh, of course, we saw uh, how this vaccine was uh, very pushed to European markets, also to other markets. Uh, other markets were more open. European was one that uh, I felt pressure upon because of history uh, in, in relationships with Russia. So, um, uh, and later it appeared that, uh, well, Sputnik V doesn't have these production volumes that are required to export. Uh, so there are not enough vaccines for internal use and they are selling it uh, to other countries and really tweeting about every nation that <laughs> has a tender. So it really shows that it's a um, state-backed uh, marketing campaign, vaccine marketing campaign. And uh, clearly there's a strategy. And uh, I think Russia is acting as like um, very, mm, like, uh, like a businessman, I'd say. Uh, like all the strategies where you are smearing your competition, or you are using various uh, means uh, to, to basically uh, undermine trust 
in the competitor's product. This is all that we can see. So definitely there, there is a strategy behind that, of course. This is a great point because many times when we're talking about state-backed campaigns, we think about their geopolitical goals and sometimes we don't really think about Okay, this is commerce too, right? There's a commercial and a financial interest there of being able to sell your vaccines. So thank you for bringing this. I think this is a very important point for us to focus in. I want to turn to Joey now. And you had already mentioned the consequences, the possible consequences of this information uh, for the vac vaccine rollout in Egypt. So I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about that, uh, but also, I wanted to, to uh, understand, uh, we spoke about, so far we spoke about the US, uh, Russia and China. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the domestic uh, environment and in Egypt. And how does this like dispute, this information dispute affect, uh, the, domestic, affect the domestic situation in Egypt? Uh, for instance, we heard about many com conspiracy theories in the US. Did you see that in Egypt? What is going on? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think that question really speaks to our internet connected, you know, globalized world. Um, I've seen every conspiracy theory everyone mentioned on this panel um, in Arabic, in Egypt, um, in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE. Um, and so I think that there's this sort of that you have these export, conspiracy exporting countries, um, obviously China, Russia, the US to a certain extent. Um, and then you have the peripheries, which are sort of the recipients of this. Um, and you see them in their pure form, but then you also see them localized within their specific domestic context as well. Um, and so I've seen every sort of conspiracy theory as, as you guys um, mentioned um, in Arabic, um, you know, in the Egyptian context. Um, I think that your first question about the consequences of disinformation on the um, vaccine rollout in Egypt, um, I think, as I mentioned, it's, it's hugely consequential. Um, and I think it speaks to, you know, the country's um, information environment more broadly. Um, as I mentioned, there has been huge public distrust um, in the official case numbers that have been released and data that has been released. Um, and the public just doesn't really trust what the state says. Um, and so when the state goes to actively uh, disrupt these conspiracy theories, they also, the public also doesn't really um, listen to that very much and doesn't take it in. Um, and so any sort of broader public health messaging program that the Ministry of Health or other uh, state institutions are trying to enact ends up falling on deaf ears. Um, and as I mentioned, the uh, vaccine rollout has been slow so far. It's been picking up recently. Um, and so there's not quite yet enough vaccines to sort of realize the effect that hesitancy um, is going to have. But I, I really think that in the coming months, it's going to be a huge issue because even if the state is trying to disrupt these conspiracy theories, the public has just become so used to the same narratives of fear and rumor mongering that it's not going to be very effective. Yeah, on that note, I would also like to ask you all, um, what do you think are the, the effects of this disinformation campaigns on the way that states dealt with the pandemic? So both at the beginning and now with vaccines, and we can start with Elise. Um, I, that's a, yeah, that's a, like, I, like, I think I come back to what I said at the start, which is that there isn't a tidy answer to that. Um, different states have dealt with it very, very differently. Um, I wouldn't say that we've seen, um, as far as we're aware, that we've seen uh, like a, any example of like a particular state-backed campaign influencing another state's decision-making. Um, I think we probably have seen um, some... Yeah, it's, it, it's difficult to say without sort of like focusing on a specific context what, what the example would be there. I, I think I, I would sort of underscore a couple of points that I think um, Joey and Nika made. Um, one about sort of the role of, of domestic actors. Um, like I think there has been a sort of an assumption um, generally when you see sort of uh, disinformation which is focused on vaccines, there's an assumption to 
that it must be coming from an international actor and motivated by a ge like a geopolitical motive, um, when the reality is the, the rollout of vaccines in countries is a very political issue. Um, and there's a lot of motivations for domestic political actors to, um, for example, promote one vaccine over another. Um, and as part of that, they may amplify uh, messaging that is coming from these international campaigns, for example, promoting pro-Sputnik pro content, which is coming out of the official Russian marketing campaign, but in a covert way um, to promote their own interests within their own countries. Um, so I think that's a, a significant factor. Um, I guess the other thing is, um, we have sometimes seen arguably some of this disinformation efforts backfire. Um, and I am thinking like particularly the, the example of Russia here um, in terms of sort of anti-vaccine anti disinformation aimed at other parts of the world, um, coming back to, to stoke um, vaccine hesitancy within Russia, um, which I think is uh, also a significant aspect of it. You, like the, the fact that you can't um, silo off your population from, from whatever it is that you're promoting to the rest of the world. Nika, do you yeah. want to talk about that? Yeah, I can, I can definitely agree to, to that. I think uh, this uh, disinformation campaign uh, really backfired, but uh, to be frank, uh, public trust in um, government institutions is not very high. I mean, um, like people are taught to stay away from politics. At the same time, they need to deal with some level of bureaucracy and they see that there is corruption and um, even uh, TV shows, they show how you can bribe, how you can um, manipulate with people to achieve something. So the trust uh, to public institutions is low uh, and um, it's just combination of both. Um, on the other hand, um, currently Russia is dealing also with a very uh, severe situation in, in sense of cases. The new Delta variant is spreading there. And um, uh, now, yeah, it's turning back to basically forcing people to take vaccines. And uh, if before this narrative was basically used to show, oh, uh, other countries need to make people to take vaccine and see how Russia looks democratic, uh, that, that now, yeah, they can't, they are basically cornered uh, into this situation and they need to turn to more extreme measures with that. Okay, um, yeah, lack of trust, I think it's extremely important and it's something that, um, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I don't even think that the media is quite ready to deal with this because what do we do in a situation in which uh, we need to, like, one message has to come across, uh, but there are many governments that you cannot trust. I see here in Brazil, for instance, we had a discussion about that because uh, that the social platforms, they were, uh, every time someone posted something about COVID, they were sending to, uh, they were linking to the official websites of the government. However, the government is the one that is denying the severity of the, the pandemic. So that was quite complicated. Speaking about uh, lack of trust, Kina, I would like to hear from you, uh, not only because of China, but also because of the United States. And we know that in the beginning of the pandemic, so uh, with the change of government in the US, that dealing with the pandemic changed a lot. So how are you seeing this? Well, I think it's, pretty well known that, you know, in some part of the states in the U.S., um, like particularly like, like the more blue states, right, um, the vaccination rate is way higher than some of the states, you know, in the South. And I, I think um, the impact, you know, the initial dismiss and the little downplaying um, of the pandemic and its, um, and the public policy, I mean, the health policy, has been consequential, um, you know, and the last administration uh, is, I mean, uh, there with um, the pandemic, very different from, you know, um, the current one. And, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, um, it's a very in interesting observation. Um, and I guess that's all I can offer <laughs> for now. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask you another question because I saw that you wrote about that. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, there were many questions about the origins of the virus. And then um, there was not only the bioweapon theory, but also um, the, the idea that the 
virus had leaked from the Wuhan lab, uh, became very strong in the US and President, uh, former President Trump mentioned it and he had uh, said he had a high degree of confidence but he did not show evidence. So many social platforms again, uh, social media platforms, they decided like to, to flag this as misleading content. And now we are seeing that this discussion is back. Um, so I wanted to ask, start with Kinan, but ask all of you, as researchers, how do we deal with it? So we want to we want to say that something is misleading or is a conspiracy theory, but science evolves in a different way, right? Uh, creating scientific knowledge takes longer; it just has a different time. Uh, when we know that disinformation and conspiracy theories they circulate very very fast. So how do you think we can deal with it using this lab leak theory as a case study? Well, I. I I would say we have to be upfront about what we know, what we don't know. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, we are researchers and journalists. We don't, and I don't think most of us has a background in biology or microbiology. So we rely on um, our reporting, our researching, or researching from the specialist. I would say in the case of the lab leak theory, I think it's more of an example of how the political discourse and pressure in the US um, affect uh, platforms policy right as, as far as i can as i can tell i haven't seen any underlying or material change um, of the science community's uh view on uh the origin of the virus uh which is like um but in, but there's like a growing voice you know calling for further and more thorough investigation and for the platform you know uh I don't want to, I don't want to get into their mind, you know, uh, it's, it's their policy and they make mistakes all the time. And I don't think it's, it's necessary. It's, I, I don't think it's a necessary ne negative re reflection on their side that, you know, they update their policy on, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily good or bad. Um, just like journalists, you know, we update our reporting, you know, uh, uh, so that was the case. Um, yeah. Yes, of course. It's something that I think we are all learning as we go along, right? After all, we had not been through a huge pandemic uh, after the internet was created. So, Joey, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I agree. I think that we need to be upfront. Um, none of us are scientists. Um, disinformation researchers are not scientists. So we need to admit when the science has changed um, and respond accordingly. Um, I think the more that you're honest with your audience in the same way that journalists speak openly and, audience, uh, uh, openly and honestly with their audience, disinformation researchers need to as well. Um, I wanna make another point that's a bit um, off topic from this particular question, um, but I wanna talk about um, the extent to which platforms are doing not a great job at um, monitoring um, and uh, identifying conspiracy theories, um, particularly around the vaccine in non-Western languages. Um, and so obviously um, in English, the, ex the extent to which conspiracy theories, uh, particularly about the vaccine are being moderated is to a large degree. Um, obviously there's lots of political um, will behind this, you know, particularly in the US, um, but I found so much um, in the Arabic Twitter sphere and on Facebook as well, um, these conspiracy theories just stay up for ages. Um, and even just the most obvious ones about Bill Gates uh, implanting microchips in people. Um, and Twitter obviously has um, made a commitment to uh, take down this kinds of content or put uh, warning labels on it. Um, and so I think that this is an important issue to keep our eyes on as well. Um, because, uh, you know, moderation needs to be across the board and be applied equally to all languages. Um, and especially for, with these sorts of harmful conspiracy theories that have very tangible public health impacts, it's all the more important to be making sure that they're also not proliferating um, in non-Western languages as well. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to ask you a question that is coming from the audience. Um, Based on the on your experience monitoring state actors' behaviors to the COVID infodemic, what would they expect to see in the next infodemic, assuming there will be a next infodemic? But I think we can turn can interpret these questions as 
what are, I think, the lessons learned and what do you think is going to come? And then imagine how can we deal with this if this happens again? Uh, Nika. Thanks. Yeah, I think it actually answers also the, the previous question. So um, if the next infodemic comes, we need to be proactive. Uh, strategic communication by the government, I think, is very, very important. And strategic communication means that what you say is what you do. So you build trust. And this is the key, building trust with whichever process you are dealing with. And uh, what we observe now, the main lesson learned for, for me is that, especially with anti-vax narratives, it's a symmetrical game because all anti-vaxxers need to do is saw doubt. That's it. They saw doubt in uh, person like medical personnel. You don't trust your doctor. He is uh, corrupt by big pharma. Don't trust your politicians. They are corrupt by default. That's all and then deal, deal with situation as you can, maybe turn to uh, some, uh, I don't know, like natural drugs uh, and uh, other businesses that they develop upon this new doubt that they just created. Uh, and so what legit scientists, doctors, politicians can say is that this is what we know and this is how much we don't know. And the answer from the public is that oh, you don't know, and you are testing this vaccine on us. You don't know if it will um, disseminate the virus and you are still using it and acting as it's not. So it's a very asymmetrical game. And as more proactive we are with communication that actually walks the talk, uh, the better we will deal with next infodemic, in my opinion. That makes a lot of sense. Elise? Um, I mean... I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think this, the questions of sort of truth and trust and doubt and facts are like fundamental to, to all of this. I mean, it actually does tie back to the, the question of the lab leak hypothesis. I mean, that we, we do have to adapt as the science changes, but as far as I understand, the science hasn't changed on the lab leak hypothesis. As far as I'm aware that there's no new facts from last year when we all dismissed it as a conspiracy theory. What's changed is the political circumstances around that theory. Um, and I think that does uh, underline the the core challenge that we face here, which is that these are very political spaces um, where sort of different theories gain traction for different political agendas um, and sort of navigating a way through that that sort of comes out to, to an outcome where everybody can trust that what we're being told is, is factual um, and is accurate and is not sort of distorted in any way is, is the challenge. Um, in terms of the disinformation space, I sort of suspect we're going to see a shift away from um, the kind of mass bot campaigns that we've seen um, from a variety of actors in the past to more of a use of influencers. Um, I, I agree with Nikki that the, that the FAS case in Russia doesn't appear that it was likely to have been top-down directed. Um, but I, I think in general, just the rise of influencers is going to be a really significant component. Um, uh, understanding the ways in which different platforms incentivize different kinds of behavior and different kinds of disinformation campaigns, I think is going to be really interesting and important. Um, but also sort of looking at um, organic grassroots disinformation efforts. So, uh, which is what conspiracy theories are to some extent um, and sort of understanding how those two things interact, I think is also going to be very important. Joey? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, yeah, I think the, the point that Elise made about um, influencers um, is hugely important. And over the course of this year, Egypt has become, uh, has started to engage um, influencers as well. And so I think that will be a really important front. Um, I think uh, in terms of authoritarian states, their playbook will not change um, very much. Um, and I think that uh, in terms of disinformation, it's not only online, um, but I think just we should be looking at the entire ecosystem um, of how online platforms interact with state-backed media and newspapers um, and television channels. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, that will be really important. Thank you. Uh, we only have 35 seconds. So Keenan, do you wanna say one last thing about this challenges for the future? Well, I, I would say the platforms, you know, they, sh 
maybe they should be more transparent and they maybe in some crisis maybe they, they potentially they could work together you know sharing the research and uh, and i hope they will open up more to researchers like us and um, journalists to, okay to more to you Thank you very much. I uh, wish we had more time, but this was a great conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you.